Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ask Holics podcast. It's been ages since we've put out an episode, and it's not for lack of trying. During the last four weeks, and I think it's been about four weeks since we last released an episode, we have tried twice in that period of time, including yesterday, to record an episode. And for technical issues, we were unable to. Um, I, I guess that doesn't excuse the absence, but but we did try. Uh, but it is great to be back. I've got Mize with me and I've got Aaron with me as well. Hello, boys. Hello, mate. Good evening. How are you? Good, good. Very eager. To, I'm just excited, man. Like, you know, it just missed the podcast. Yeah, you know, I missed, I've missed recording a successful, successfully recording an episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, like I said, we we experiment with new things in preseason. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But all good as long as you deliver in the main season, mate. I'm, I have faith in you. Right. Should we start trying to get off to a good start? So what I'm going to try and do is, um, well, actually, I'm going to first say my obligatory. Please, thank you for listening. Um, and can you please like? share subscribe everyone uh always appreciated we are though right now um on the cusp of the new season preseason is over so actually you know this whole period that we haven't recorded a lot has happened so i'm going to do the bulk of my talking on this episode right now by just covering very quickly everything that's happened over the last four plus weeks and then you know really handing over to these guys to to um reflect on how we think it's gone so here we go here is my summary of preseason so far because there's been a lot there's been a lot of ins there's been a lot of outs there's been a lot of games played so here we go we signed marquinos eddie nakecha signed a new deal fabio vieira signed kind of came out of nowhere brilliant out of the blue throwback type of signing matt turner then signed as a uh, sub goalkeeper um, from the US, Matteo Guendouzi officially left the club. Uh, we saw that coming. He was on loan, but he's officially left. Within our first preseason game, behind closed doors, beating Ipswich 5 1. The worst kept secret in football happened, and we signed Gabriel Jesus, uh, a deal that was rumbling for ages, and it finally got announced. Amazing, really buoyed the fan base. Straight away, we went to Germany, played Nuremberg 1 5 3. Uh, I think we went down a couple of goals initially, but one five three. Gabriel Jesus making his debut and scoring. Jack Wilshire randomly also retired and immediately returned as a as a under eighteen coach, which was awesome news. Started our tour to the US before a game started. Omari Hutchinson decided to leave, uh, and he went to Chelsea, which was a surprise. He was kind of in and around the squad at the end of last season, but he's gone to Chelsea. Random, but anyway, that didn't put us off. Winning our next game against Everton, we won 2 0. We released a black kit, this kit, this awesome, awesome kit. Um, we then played Orlando. We beat them 3 1. We signed Zinchenko when we missed out on Martinez. But did we really miss out on Martinez or was it just trying to push the price up? So those mugs, those red mugs of Man United um, paid over the odds, clearly over the odds for him. And we got a four time uh, Premier League winner in Zinchenko. Uh, we went on and beat Chelsea 4 0, battered Chelsea 4 0, surprised everyone again, I think, playing such a good team and winning 4 0. We then came back from the US, played another behind closed doors friendly. Sadly, we lost to Brentford 2 1. The good news was it was basically the B stroke C team. Many of those players are not actually with the club, I think, anymore. Uh, they've been loaned or sold. We released a pink third kit, which I personally have ordered, and it looks pretty cool, pretty different to the black kit, but awesome. Adidas delivering once again. Tavares then left to go to Marseille on loan. I guess there's going to be no room for him given uh, Zinchenko was signed. Uh, hopefully it works out as well as it did for Saliba. Odegaard named as club captain. Uh, generally, everyone, sort of one of everyone's favourite picks, but he got the job. Good luck to him. We went on and celebrated that with a 6-0 win over Sevilla, who had the best defensive record in La Liga last season. Six goals past them. Clearly, they missed Jules Kunde, but whatever it is, it is 6-0. And that is where preseason has ended for Arsenal. So just to summarise again with that, if you take all those games, including the behind closed doors games, we lost one, won the rest of them, scoring 26 in the process and conceding seven. If you take away the behind closed doors games and we won every game, Gabriel Jesus, top scorer with seven really hitting the ground running. And now we are a few days away from the start of the season. Boys, I'm going to try and not say very much from now on, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Aaron, tell me, what did you think of preseason? How Have I summarized it well? And, and how do you feel it's gone? Oh, mate, what a what a summary. 
I mean, what a way to kick off. Congrats. Um, Thank you. I mean, I don't know how to follow that really, but um, I, it's hard not to be excited for what's to come, right? I think you look at this team, it feels a lot more complete. It feels a lot more mature. I mean, yeah, the players are, you know, are one season older, but you, you know, you look at that team that was like, like lined up against um, Sevilla. We had those like black tracksuit tops on, which I think look pretty cool as well. And, you know, whilst, yeah, we're still a young team, but this team looked like a much more mature team. You throw in Gabriel Jesus, Sinchenko, two to, like Premier League winners into that team. You've got Ramsdale, who last season didn't start the season as, as our number one, is now number one. We have uh, a new centre-back in Saliba. We have Ben White. We have um, Gabriel, who now like know what they're doing. They know how to play with each other. We have Thomas Partey, Granit Xhaka, Martin Odegaard, our new captain. We have uh, two young players in uh, Saka and Martinelli, who are a year older and have like been through all the ups and downs of last season and can now hopefully use that experience to kick on so you know for the first time I looked at that team yesterday and I thought actually this is quite hard to improve upon now like the players that come into the starting 11 are actually that will come into starting 11 if they are going to come in need to be like really good to get into this team like otherwise who are you taking out and now the question is more around the squad the substitutes there's still a bit of work to do there fitness on those substitutes and then yeah it's it's I think the excuses are running out now. It's time to deliver. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this team are capable of. Well said, mate. My, you know, just looking at the recruitment aspect specifically about it, we obviously didn't finish in the top four last season, missed out on Champions League football. And I think we all felt that may have ramifications on the summer. Mm. With all the business that we've done so far, how would you rate it out of 10, all things considered? Um. So I think, yeah, it's a good point that you make, right? Because at the end of last season, you would have thought that the targets that we were probably lining up in the hope that we were going to get uh, Champions League football this season, um, the targets might have shifted because we obviously didn't we didn't get that fourth spot. And it doesn't really look like that had, has happened. I kind of expected with Gabriel Jesus, um, you know, those links started towards the end of last season, that our links with, with him. Um, and I thought that either another club that could offer Champions League football would come in and kind of, yeah, would come in at the last minute or come in late on and um, and sort of uh, take take him away from us um, or possibly it was uh, dependent on us getting Champions League football. So I think what the club have been able to do in securing a player like that, and I think when you look at the other additions as well, um, it's extremely impressive. There's still... There's still gaps. Um, the, squ- the squad overall looks much, much stronger, as um, Aaron and touched on. Uh, but there are still some gaps, which I'm sure we're going to talk about um, and kind of highlight. But I think overall, for me, the window's been been really, really good. Like I would probably give it, I mean, if I was giving it a number out of 10, like eight or nine out of 10, I would say. Um, and I think there's still, like Aaron has said, still work to be done, still some outgoings um, that are kind of, in motion at the moment. Um, the Leno deal has just been officially confirmed. I don't know if you guys just saw literally mm-hmm. in the last like five minutes or so. Okay. So that's, oh, nice. that's now happened. That's another player kind of off the wage, wage bill um, uh, with obviously on, on big money, big, big salary. So, um, so yeah, overall, I'm really, really happy. And I think when you look at, I mean, I, so for me personally, preseason is preseason. I think what we're going to face on, you know, starting on Friday night at Selhurst Park is a very, very different challenge, obviously. Right. So we could be smashing teams, whoever we play in preseason, but ultimately you think you have to take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. Um, and it's, it's great that we're winning games rather than losing them. Obviously it's building the confidence, you know, scoring goals. Um, you know, our strikers are scoring goals. It's fantastic. You know, um, that's all great. But um, I think for me, preseason is, is just that. And it's going to be a very, very different challenge. It's going to be a step up on Friday, obviously. Um, so it will be interesting to see kind of how we actually deal with a team at home, you know, under the light, basically same kind of similar kind of scenario as last season, obviously, right, against Brentford. Um, and, and you know, it could kind of all come crashing back down very, very quickly. 
Um, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious, but I think in terms of the transfer window, I'm, I'm over the moon, you know, getting a couple of players from city that, um, would have, if they had stayed, they probably would have played a number of minutes. They might not have started, mm. you know, maybe more than half the games, let's say, but they would have been part of the squad of, a, for a team that are competing on all four fronts are going to be near the top of the league, if not top of the league, and probably getting towards the latter stage of the Champions League. And, and Jesus and Zinchenko would have been part of, they would have got a lot of minutes in those in, in, in those matches um, throughout the season. So yeah, I'm absolutely chuffed with w- what we've done so far. And I think there's, I think, I think to be honest, that there are a couple of concerns. Um, uh, but I think potentially, you know, things things have kind of gone a little bit quiet on the incomings, but they did. And then Fabio Vieira just came out of nowhere, right? So mm. kind of hoping that there might be another one or two um, deals that Edu's got up his sleeve that we just don't know about yet. Um, and I'm sort of thinking central midfield and, and a wide forward, depending on what happens with Pepe. But but overall, yeah, I'm I'm very, very happy with what we've done so far this summer. It is interesting from an attacking perspective, isn't it? Because like you mentioned, Fabio Vieira, and he was one of the first signings that we made, um, you know, in, in the summer. And he is someone that we didn't know much about at all. Uh, and we still don't know that much about him in terms of what we've seen because he hasn't played a minute yet. But is is that, Aaron, does that encourage you in, a, in, in some sense? Because we've scored a shed load of goals in preseason, like a whole load of goals. But clearly they thought that creativity is an area that we need to strengthen further in the window. And they got this guy who's uh, on paper the best creator in, in the Portuguese league, which I know overall, you know, doesn't necessarily have the competitiveness of the Premier League. But the, the Portuguese league tends to export some very, very, very successful Premier League players. So we've got this guy who is a creator who hasn't played a minute yet of preseason. Does that encourage you that, you know, potentially we're doing so well anyway? And this is just a, a, a further addition that might you know, crank it up a notch. Yeah, absolutely. I I do still think we need some more goals in this team and we might discuss this later on, but what I think, what the priority is for the next signing, if hopefully there's one more, maybe there's two more, who knows, will, will I think depend a lot on how we intend to use Fabio Vieira. You know, there's there's talk that he could play pretty much across anywhere across the front three or maybe not up front, but left or right but also as a number 10, potentially as number eight. If we see him as the number eight, maybe number 10 type player, then it allows us to then go and get uh, maybe a wide forward or uh, you know a, another striker, for example. But um, perhaps his speciality, maybe the idea is for him to come in and play, play left or play right, for example, in the front three. And that means actually we might have enough numbers there and we can then focus our attention on potentially an attacking eight or a or a six, for example. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited because we've seen this team now. We kind of know what the plan is, especially for the Palace game. I think we can pretty accurately predict the first eleven. But yeah, you know, we've gone through this preseason without you know Tommy Asu and Tierney, who come come February, we'll probably say we're two two of our best players and two of our most important mm. players, and they're nowhere to be seen. And we're still really confident about what's going to happen on Friday, hopefully. Um, and then you throw Smith Rowe into the mix, you throw Fabio Vieira into the mix. There are opportunities to change things and tweak things. And all these players are good players. Um, but, you know, what that means in terms of the transfer priorities, I, I don't know, because I don't think we really know where the manager sees Fabio Vieira playing. But it does sound that when we signed him, I think it was Edu commented on I think the Arsenal.com video that you know, we signed him with a very specific skill set and a specific uh, trait, like attributes in mind. I think he talked about like how he can turn, how he can receive the ball close, his close control. So this wasn't like a fluke signing. This was a signing that we felt we needed and we went out to address a gap in the squad. But I don't think any of us really know what exactly that gap is. Is it a a goal scoring gap? Is it a creative gap? Is it a, you know, transition gap? So that I think is the biggest mystery, but it's it's a nice mystery, right? We've got this new signing and we have no idea what he's going to do and where he's going to play. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of not just with regards to where he's going to play, but the, the, the squad overall over this, over this preseason, Mize, from what we've seen of the team, we've been quite lucky in some ways in in, in the, the last two games. Arteta has basically started with the same side. So against Chelsea and, and Sevilla, I believe it was the same 11 that started. And it's 
an, an 11 that very very possibly could be as you mentioned the team that starts against palace so in a way we've had an opportunity of just not not necessarily just seeing the lineup but how arteta perhaps wants to play this season uh, have there been any kind of glaring changes that you've noticed in this preseason than than before and if i just if i take one as an example you know we've that the, having Ben White and, and Zinchenko as as fullbacks and ha- what that might mean to the setup, things like that. Is there anything that's mm. taken that you've taken notice of that's interesting? Yeah, I mean the obvious one. So I think when you're looking at um, kind of upfront, the obvious one is if you're looking at what we've changed from last season in terms of personnel, Hazus in for Lacazette. You know, obviously Hazus offers so 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 much more, and that that was evident i mean i didn't watch the chelsea game to be fair so i, I couldn't really comment um uh, i can't really comment too much apart from the goals but you know the Sevilla game it was very very evident even from was it the first goal i think it was the first goal um you know maybe, well, maybe the second i can't remember now but you know hazus going out wide ben white um kind of clipping a ball out to him and the ball finding its way into the box and hazus is the player on the end of that finishing the chance that kind of breaks for him so he's you know gone from um, out wide left into the box in the space of a few seconds. And that's something that Lacazette obviously would never do. So so I think I think that's the obvious one. And I think what that now gives us, and I kind of said it as soon as we were linked with a, a Gabriel Jesus or as soon as we were linked with him, is we now have, you pretty much have kind of three forwards, Marcel Saka and Jesus, that can pretty much interchange um, and are very, very mobile forwards. And it just gives you this, like, you guys probably noticed it, right? So like, there was often times where Martinelli and Jesus were switching positions and Martinelli was going through the middle. Then Saka and Martinelli were switching left and right. Um, and I think that's what Arteta is building, kind of similar to the City model, right? Where they just have the they have a bunch of very good kind of attacking players, but you wouldn't be able to say that Phil Foden is a wide left forward or he, you know, he can play through the middle as a false nine. He can probably play as a number 10. And similarly with other players that they've got, um, that they're just all very adaptable and it makes this it, it they just fit the system essentially and i think that's something that we're moving towards and i think that was really apparent against sevilla i think the other thing that i noticed was um was was having fullbacks like ben white and um zinchenko starting that game when we when we had the ball uh, i don't know if you guys noticed this but you sort of started to see both of them push up uh, push up and push quite central as well. So you kind of have party now sitting, not now, party sitting pretty deep. Xhaka, Xhaka kind of steps forward into um, not number 10 role alongside Erdegaard, but he steps forward as a more attacking midfielder. And then to kind of squeeze the pitch uh, or squeeze um, the opposition further up when we've got the ball, you then have Zinchenko and Ben White who kind of flank Partey. Um, and again, that's really similar to the City model, right? Like you've got Cancelo who does it for City all the time. He kind of, kind of plays this inverted fullback. And I think that having those two players, um, funnily enough, maybe not our, maybe, maybe not our first choice right and left back, um, but having those two players starting does give you that option. I'm not sure if you have Kieran Tierney in the team that he necessarily could, could do that because he's more like kind of up and down down the mm. flank left back. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's some really, really exciting things. And I think, I think, like I said, the, the, the really exciting thing for me and the kind of change that I'm, that you see, it's just a huge upgrade on Lacazette, right? Like we all see it, we all knew it was going to come and we all, we all expected it, but to actually see it now and to see it kind of, albeit in preseason coming to fruition, you know, having a play like Jesus just offering everything that you want from not just the number nine, but just like a very, very good attacking player. Um, it's just really, really nice to see. Uh, how much um, do you, know, Gabriel Jesus has, like you mentioned, he's, he came with a reputation. He's hit the ground running. He's been you know scoring for fun. Um, and I suppose it's hard to know how much of it is down to the quality of player and how much is it that the quality of the player has enabled us to play a system like the one that you've described? Because what people are sort of suggesting now is this this system that you started alluding to that we, we seem to be playing in preseason ends up being almost a 2-3-5 in, in possession. You effectively have Xhaka pushing up almost in, in, in an attacking, to make part of this attacking five when we're in possession. And you have these two fullbacks who are coming into these midfield roles almost central midfield areas the, the midfield half spaces if you like right like just um outside the center and it's very interesting it's it's clearly something that Arteta felt that last season um maybe we didn't have the personnel to to play in that system certainly Nuno Tavares wasn't the sort of play, player who could who resembles Zinchenko in any way 
Um, do you, are you intrigued by what this could present? I mean, I one of the downsides to a system like this, um, from what I understand from people who understand tactics a lot more than me, is that it requires a lot of effort from wingers to get back and a lot of effort from, so therefore, the wider players do a lot of defensive work. So people like Martinelli and Saka. Do you worry a little bit about you know, someone like Saka who is such a prodigious talent, someone who, you know, is is incredibly capable, but is also someone that we covered last season was just played so much, um, now kind of almost playing in a system where he's probably going to be asked to do even more work, Vice? Uh, I, I mean, I think there's always a concern with any new system, right? And it probably is going to take a fair bit of time to... Um... To, for us to kind of adapt to it and get it right. So there's that concern. I, I'm sure there's going to be loads of occasions where we're probably going to, going to get exposed where we just haven't got it right. But mm. I think if you're talking about sort of, I guess, two things. One is the two players that you mentioned. I think they're, they've been a part of this system, or, or should I say they've been part of the Arteta, um, I'm going to use the word project, right? Um, they've been part of that project since the start. So I feel like, there's no, it's not like you're bringing in a new player and asking him to kind of adapt to the tactics as it were, right? He, they, they've, they've been there on the training ground and I feel like there shouldn't be too much of an issue asking those two players to do that kind of role and have that defensive kind of mindset um, when when they need to. And I think they're two, again, two very, um, well, obviously two very youthful players, right? So you, I don't really have too many concerns about kind of fatigue because they're they're at the right age to be performing that kind of role. It's not like you're asking like Cristiano Ronaldo to be tracking back um, for half the game or whatever. Um, and I think also with so, we, I was going to say we're really well stocked in those positions. I mean, it depends how you look at it, but I feel like when you talk about Vieira and you talk about Smithrow, um, and even if you put Pepe into the mix there as well, you know, if you're talking, okay, Marcel is knackered after 70 minutes in a given game and we need to switch it up, we have options this season or we have options um and they're fairly good options um so so you know if we if it just means the players are going to have to work hard for the system to work then so be it but you know um i don't i don't really have that many concerns i think it's more a case of then there's probably going to be occasions where we're going to like we're going to get found out or it's just not going to work because it's just it that's just part of learning a new system right and learning a new tactic um and mm. maybe players having to do something they haven't necessarily done before so um, no, I'm I'm really excited for it because I think you know you saw it on on Saturday. It was really really good to watch, and I I preach. It did look like Sevilla didn't really turn up with any intention of doing anything in that game, but um, you know it feels like it's one of those systems when it when it clicks, it's going to be like bloody good to watch. Um, and it could be yeah. really, really exciting in terms of the amount of goals that we're hopefully going to score and chances created. And I actually I was going to come to you, Aaron, and just on on, on a follow up there. But to be honest, actually, Mars, just just building on that because you actually were at the Sevilla game. You know, you, you you were the only one out of us that was there. Um, now, look, we touched on it earlier. Preseason is something that that it's one of those things that sometimes you should read nothing into. Sometimes you should read lots into. It means nothing and means everything in many ways. It's a very strange thing. There's been seasons I know in the past where I remember. I think I recall one year where Liverpool didn't score a goal in a preseason one year and they finished second. I think that was under. Rafa, I want to say, like it was like, and I remember from then on thinking, don't really enter anything yeah. preseason. The thing is, I don't think there's been a team in the Premier League. I'm not just saying this isn't me just trying to be flippant. There isn't a team in the Premier League I think that's had a, as a successful preseason as we have in terms of results. We've we've not only won, we've been coasting and and scoring a hell of a lot. Last two games against two big teams. 4-0 and 6-0. Um, Sevilla are a team who had the best defensive record, as I said, in the Liga last season. And yes, it's preseason, but it's only a week away from the season starting. Um, I, th- I, th- I think they said on the commentary that, I think, let, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think that they only conceded something like 24 goals in the Liga last season, which means that six in one game is a quarter of the goals that they conceded all season. Something ridiculous like that. I know they as they, they missed Jules Kunde. Anyway, mate, just... You know, let, we don't have time to analyze all of preseason. Neither should we. But if we look at that Sevilla game, did you get an impression from looking at that game and watching us and seeing it live in the flesh? Did you get an impression that we are a team that have gone up a level from last season? Uh, I I wouldn't necessarily put it all. I I, I don't know. I think it's. 
I think it's a bit early to say based on a friendly game where, you know, the atmosphere of that game was very much like family day out. You know, I took my kid, everyone else brought their kids pretty much. It was like, oh, new kits are out. Like, I know that's not, I know this, that's sort of irrelevant for the players, but that was the atmosphere in the ground. It wasn't like we came into that game and everyone's nervous and worried about what the result's going to be, obviously, right? It did really look like Sevilla just from the first minute either weren't up for it. I don't know. I have no idea what kind of was up with them, but they, they didn't really seem on it from the start. And it felt like it was a fairly easy ride for us, I would say. We were like falling mm. up in. 15 or 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah. So I I don't think based on that game, I would say so. As silly as that might sound because we won 6-0 against a team that maybe apparently doesn't really concede that many goals. Um, but I think, I, I just feel, but I think on a more general basis, I just feel like we look much, much, much more ready from a stable, I mean, the squad isn't stable because there's lots of players that are going to be leaving, lots of players that were on the bench uh, on Saturday and even some of the players that came on like Maitland Niles are probably going to be leaving. So we don't actually have a, a stable squad. But when you look at the starting 11, like like you guys said, right, we could probably predict that's that's probably going to be the starting 11 that starts on Friday night. Um, and we just look, we look ready, we look prepared. Um, and that first 11, even without Tierney and, and Tommy Asu, looks very, very strong on paper. Um, there's not a player in there that I'm sort of like, oh, not sure about that guy. So I feel like from that perspective, um, and massively, like massively, the, the Zinchenko and Hazer signings, I think, are huge for us. I think they're just, uh, and Saliba coming back is another obvious one, right? But those three guys who all started on Saturday, um, I think that just shows kind of like the level has gone up from 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 that perspective in terms of personnel and in just in terms of, okay, not Saliba, but Zinchenko and, and Hazer's ready-made players, Premier League experience, Premier League winners coming in and you know, you wouldn't have watched say Zinchenko play for the second time for us uh, on on Saturday and think, you know, this guy is 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 a new signing. He's just come in and um, he looks he looks comfortable in that position. He looks comfortable as part of the team. Didn't can't remember him really putting a foot wrong and was mm. was involved in everything. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic overall for, for this season. Yeah, for sure. Aaron, from a kind of fan's perspective, like my, is it, you know, I'm optimistic. It feels like most Arsenal fans on Twitter, if you look at it, are optimistic. Um, but maybe that's that's just in the nature of being a fan at the beginning of the season. But at the same time, right, you know, Mize just mentioned Zinchenko. We talk about Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko. These are, four, these are two players who have both won the Premier League four times. They're 25 years old. They both came from one of the best teams in Europe, um, a team that goes toe-to-toe with anyone, the Premier League champions. They're always competing for the Premier League. They're competing for the Champions League. They've always got as good a chance of winning the Champions League as any. They were two players in that squad. Essentially, they are good enough to get into any squad in the world on that basis. They really are. At 25 years of age, for them to come and join a football club who are not in the Champions League, does that say something about the fact that it's not just us as fans getting kind of bought into this ride and whatever. Is there genuinely something going on behind the scenes that you feel that players are looking at going, shit, this could go somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I would have loved to have been in that meeting when, you know, I don't know who it was, Edu or Arteta, whoever it was, went to Gabriel Jesus or Zinchenko and said, yeah, this is a project. This is what we're building. And I would have I'd loved to have heard what he said um, because, you know, we believe it as fans, but it, it would have been something, you know, the fact that we're convincing these established, proven Premier League players to come to us is a huge coup for us. Um, like you said, this, this is, they're 25, right? This is their, this is their contract now. Right? The, the next four years are their peak years. Um, and they've decided that I'm going to give this to Arsenal and I'm going to have a go at whatever we're building. And I don't think they would have said, we're going to try and get top four for the next four seasons. I think the pitch, the the project was, we are going to get, we are going to try to get as close to Liverpool and Man City as possible in the next two, three, four years. Um, Because I don't think players like that come to say, we are going to be fighting for top four every year. Um, And, 
and yeah, I think they would have been, you know, sold also for them, for them personally. They were sold on the team and where the team's going, but also what they can do as part of this story. You know, Gabriel Jesus can be, you are going to be the number nine, um, especially in a World Cup year for a Brazilian. That's super important, right? To say, mm-hmm. I'm going to start and I'm going to get every chance to play and start for Brazil in the World Cup in November. I need to be starting every game from now until November, right? So I think that probably had an effect for him. Zinchenko, I just think, you know, he was an Arsenal fan. That obviously helps as a kid. He, he's worked with Mikel Arteta. That obviously helps. So it's it, it lowers the risk for both parties. It lowers the risk for us because we know these players. Our manager knows these players. He knows what they're like to train. He knows what they're like um, to, you know, when they're up, when they're down, what motivates them. He knows what gets them going. Um, and then for the players, they know what the environment's going to be like. They know what the style of football is going to be like. They know what they're going to be asked to do because they've, pretty much been doing it for the last three, four years under Pep. Mm. So it's it's just really smart business. And the fees we paid, was it 30 million for Zinchenko, 50 million for Jesus? You look at the fees that are going around, especially for strikers now. You know, I'm not saying like, you know, Richardson, uh, Nunes, these are big numbers, but there's an element of risk in all of mm-hmm. those. But I think with Jesus, you know, we can argue, and we did argue, right, previously about what the ceiling is for Jesus and is he going to get 20, 25, 30 goals or whatever. But you're not, he's going to get 10, 15 goals at least, like guaranteed. The floor is really high for him. Um, and there's an element of certainty that he knows the football, he knows the Premier League, he's done it at a decent level. He can continue to do this easily. Um, and then, and yeah, and I think, you know, people forget, right? Like, we basically played all of last season without a striker <laughs> and um, we, bit we got fifth. Yeah. Bit, okay. Well, bit insulting we, to a man we, with so okay, much sauce. We played. Laka had so much <laughs> sauce. You can at least acknowledge that he was a striker. That was his position. Uh, he, he was a striker. Fine. All right. We, we went all of last season. Who was our top scorer? Saka. Our, our strikers got like four or five goals last season. Like, and we, we, and we still almost scraped fourth and we basically blew it without having a a recognized striker so Mm -hmm. just the fact that we've got him plus a hopefully improved Eddie Nketiah should guarantee so many more goals and like you said Mize he makes other people better I think you know you've seen Martinelli how much more improved he has been in pre-season a lot of that is because of Jesus right like he will go left Jesus and allow Martinelli to come in um Martinelli will put all those crosses into the far post that Gabriel Jesus will love um He's making everyone else around him better. So not only is he adding goals, he will hopefully add goals to everyone else as well. And that's the thing that I'm really excited about. We we talked about players that we've signed. Um, there's a player that has come into the team now who is a French international and was young player of the season in the French League last year. Uh, he broke the record for the most amount of passes made in any season in the French League in League One. Um, oh, no yeah, by any player, not just a defender, by any player. The most passes made by any player. He's someone who I got a lot of stick for a couple of years ago because when we signed him initially, um, I told my friends that he was going to start for us and they all put him in their dream team. And then um, he didn't start against Fulham um, <laughs> and uh, he, he went off on loan. I got a lot of shit for it. But this preseason, his name is William Saliba, and he has effectively been a core part of a central defensive partnership with Gabriel. Um, played the last two games. Mize, you know, again, he's not someone that we've signed, but he effectively is a new player. And if you were to say to someone, if a club were to say, sign a player of the profile I've just mentioned, you know, French international young player of the year, you're talking about a fifty million pound player, right? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. When you hear the price of people like Fafana who have been mm. touted at 80 million and this is a player, Fafana is not in, is the same age and isn't in the French squad. Um, wh- wh- what do you think about that? It, it is going under the radar. Not many people outside Arsenal are talking about this. Um, have you been impressed with him in preseason? And do you think that he's going to be playing a lot of games? If not, you know, is he a first choice centre back for Arsenal? Yeah, I mean, so at the moment with Tommy Yasu injured, I think the the, the kind of back four uh, almost picks itself, right? Um, so 
he's I think yeah and I think when you can't really rely on a bit maybe a bit um, harsh but based on Tommy Ass's injury record in the season that he's had with us I'm not sure you can necessarily rely on him for a whole season let's see what happens but on the assumption that there's going to be periods where Tommy Ass is out um, you kind of would probably prefer I don't know I, I feel like I'd prefer Ben White right back rather than Cedric and then Saliva mm-hmm. comes into the team you know um, Why is that even a question? Come on. I don't know. <laughs> Literally, you're, so happy, some... you're so happy so... with that. Oh, look at him grinning. Yeah, some, oh, no, some, I was just about to make man. this point. Right. No, no, I was just about to make this point. I think Saliba's biggest impact is the fact that he is keeping, <laughs> he solves our right back problem. No, he solves he's our not backup that right back problem. Bad, mate. I don't know. He's not that No, no, but, you know, but there's a significant dip between Tommy Asu, Ben White. Possibly yeah. with Saliba at right back and then Cedric. You know, but, you've never seen I mean, him at right back. How would you know possibly, Saliba's possibly, any good at right back? Look at this possibly. agenda. Okay, forget Saliba. No, no, forget a bit, about a Saliba. But are you seriously <laughs> telling me yeah. that there is not a significant downgrade? You saw the way we've been playing with Ben White at right back. From Tommy you think we're going down to, be to Cedric, yeah. But no, then but I think Ben White down to Cedric. Well, I don't think we've you seen think we'd have been enough of the football that we can play. So I don't think we've seen enough of Ben White at right back yet. So I think there's probably going to be, so this is what I was going to come on to, right? So it's, yeah, it's quite interesting. So so on the Ben White thing at right back, okay, all great. You know, he, he's done well in preseason, fantastic. Looks up, but then, you know, he's up against Zaha, for example, assuming this is that he starts in that position. He's up against Zaha on uh, uh, Friday. Now that could, who knows? How that could go pear shaped. It could be hot. It Fine, could go but... really bad. It could go. It could like you, and, I can and... see it. Go, you can see it already. Right, but if you're like, picking a, a right back now to go up against Zaha, who would you rather? Here's the problem, Cedric. Or... Here's the, now. Here's ben the White. problem, right? Genuinely, when we had when we played against Chelsea last season away, Ben White, yeah. Yeah. I believe, was sort of playing. We we played the funny f- formation, but he was basically playing in right back areas a lot. What I noticed that day, and I noticed it again in preseason, is the bits that he's probably weakest on when he is playing, you know, in this system as a right back, it's basically defending against a winger. Yeah, like it, it, exactly. it, it, that's probably just because otherwise he's, he plays this inverted fullback really well, really well. He's great in central areas. He's great with the ball. You know, he's, 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 he's a, he's a good defender, but he's just not naturally used to defending against wingers. It feels like he's, he's kind of sometimes out of position, a little bit funny. And like my said, you know, the Crystal Palace's, greatest ever player is Wilfred Zaha and he's still their best player now um, and he's going to come against him so in that situation I don't know man I don't know if mm. Ben White is better than <laughs> than Cedric in that situation yeah okay fine you could argue and I'll accept that in that situation one-on-one like I've not really seen Ben White at right back defend against a tricky winger right but just when you compare what Ben White gives us at right back versus like it's not what Cedric like it's not what Cedric does wrong. It's what he doesn't do. <laughs> it's what he doesn't like add. Like he can't we're... play the ball as well as Ben White. He can't, you know, step into midfield as good as Ben White. He can't, you know, Cedric's got a good cross on him to be fair, but I think it affects the whole shape of the team. And I think we are a much, much better team with Tommy Yasser at right back, Ben White at right back mm-hmm. versus Cedric at right back. Fine regardless of how good he is against Zaha, right? And there are situations where it might be. And and that's what I think, to bring this back to Saliba, I think... <laughs> Great, I was actually going to try and do, do that, this, but you did it yeah. yourself well done. <laughs> the fact that we can do this, yeah. you know, like, he is basically like a new signing, but he not only adds an option at centre-back, I think he solves the right-back problem now. And we now effectively have two options at right-back, two options at left-back, and three, four options, if you include holding at centre back and that to me the defence is is complete I think okay. I think the thing about Saliba I was just going to say so I was watching quite closely on um, Saturday uh, and bloody old man he's like if I could compare I'm trying to think of a player that I could compare like he quite, he quite he reminds me quite a lot of like how Rio Ferdinand used to play I don't know if anyone else has made that comparison. I me mean, on fucking Twitter. Oh, have you? Remember, oh, I tweeted you? it. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh, like okay. I weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I added Rio as well. Maybe that, maybe that was in the back of my mind then when I just said that. But yeah, no, yeah. I, I don't remember you saying that. But um, hundred percent. Yeah, man, he's just hundred yeah, percent. He's just such agree. a classy player. Like there was that moment in the first few minutes where he kind of, uh, um, like he looked like he was caught under in possession, and, and then he kind of managed to get away from a couple of the severe attackers. And uh, but, but uh, and I feel like. 
I don't know. I just feel like, yeah, on the ball, he just seems to be like very, very comfortable um, and doesn't seem to be phased by anything. He's actually like massive as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously all, pro all professional footballers are, you know, in terms of centre backs and stuff, but he has a real presence, presence on the pitch as well. Um, which was good to see. And yeah, just like the calmness about him, nothing really seemed to phase him. Um, want, wanted the ball. Um, and yeah, he just made, he, he seems to be one of these defenders that makes a lot look quite easy, even though it's not, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, like jewels. Mm -hmm. um, and all, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, he, and he already looks like a very, very complete defender at such a young age. I think we probably need to sort of temper expectations a bit because I'm sure he's going to make mistakes, right? I'm sure... We've, yeah. overall, we've generally got a pretty young kind of back five when you include Ramsdale. They're all going to end up making mistakes. So I just hope that, you know, if he gets a run in the team and he does start a lot of games, yeah. the thing, right? Our fans are notorious for just getting on the back of backs of players when they just need, they need to make those mistakes. So he's what, 21? Is that right? Yeah. And that's the downside of having options, right? Like the minute Saliba makes a mistake, it's going to be, oh, let's play... Tommy Asset right back, Ben White and Gabriel. Let's go back to the last back four, right? The minute Zinchenko makes a defensive mistake, because you know, he I don't think he's the strongest defense defender as such. Um, they'll say bring Tierney back. The minute Ben White makes a mistake, let's just say he gets roasted by Zaha on on Friday, right? I mean, they're gonna be like bring Tommy Asset. I don't think anyone's gonna be so bit saying bring Cedric back, just to just to add. Well, but you definitely um, won't. They're gonna be <laughs> Me and Raj they're gonna be say like, yeah. They're gonna say bring Tommy Asset back or figure something else out, right? Um so it will be really interesting to see what Arteta does with the defense this season. You know, A, what is his you know, do we have a first choice or do we actually just say, you know, for the more attacking games where we can be dominant on the ball, we play Ben White and Zinchenko where we need to sit back and defend a bit deeper or just, you know, prepare for the counter-attack, for example. We play Tierney, Tomiyasu, like who are probably better one-on-one -on -one defenders, for example. Um, oh, oh, I, I'll i be interested to see what happens. Yeah, go on. I was going to ask you guys, so when Tomiyasu's back, who, who do you think is the first choice start uh, centre-back pairing? So I personally think that we're not, I'm not going into this season thinking there's a first choice at anything, actually. Okay. Uh, I really, really think for two reasons. One reason is actually just because we're in four competitions. And I think now there is just more of a trend where managers are more willing to just pick team, like assemble a squad of various kind of skill sets and pick a team based on that game. Yeah. So, uh, and I think Arteta is that kind of manager and he's got different skill sets in each position now. The second reason is I think not enough has been made in the press about the impl the impacts of the five sub rule this season, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really think we're going to start seeing some fundamental changes. And and I'll give an example of that fundamental change. I, I think that there's chance. I think that you might see managers not even play their best their best eleven on a you know start start. They may not start with their best eleven because they know they can change the game at various points. So they might just manage game in, games in phases. They'll, they they may just actually choose to save like one of their best players for a specific entry point in the game. Um, you know, I think games will be managed in phases a lot more and you'll be willing to change tactics a lot more because you can effectively really change enough personnel to completely change your system. So I think for these reasons, I, I, I'd be reluctant to be, you know, e even make that sort of statement as to, you know, who will start and whatever. I think it'll really depend on the opposition. Because again, I think that if we, if we take an example, what William Saliba gives you in as a centre-back is he, he is really fast and he does enable you to play higher up the pitch. And actually, I think if you've got a back four of Zinchenko and Saliba and Gabriel and Ben White, you can probably play really high up the pitch. Mm. Um, but actually with some of our other combinations, you can't. And not playing that high up the pitch also impacts kind of, you know, other things and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I really make, there's a long way of answering your question as to like, I, I'm I'm not really sure if if everyone is fit, who the best 11 is and, and, you know, how it's going to be. I really think it's going to be a game by game basis. I don't know what you think, Aaron. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I mean, look, this, we're, it's very clear now we're following the Man City playbook here, yeah. almost to a T in that sense. And, you know, Pep, I, you know, Pep is, you know, a bit crazy with his rotation, right? And I don't think Arteta will go that far, mainly because he don't, we don't have the squad yet of that level, of, that level of depth, right? But there are games where, you know, third round of the FA Cup, Man City are at home to some League Two team, and he's starting De Bruyne at home, 
right? And then um, and Mares against his League Two team, and then like in the Premier League, he'll drop Mares and he'll play uh, Foden or you know Graylish or or someone else, right? And I think I genuinely think across the four competitions, we will rotate a lot more this season because of the five subs as well. We can take players off, rest them early, give them sixty minutes, seventy minutes, um, and we will hopefully have a squad that is more ready and more interchangeable. One of the mm-hmm. downsides of not being in the Europa League last year was, you know, we all thought this was a blessing, but actually yeah, it's hard to say with hindsight, but, you know, it got to the point in March, April last year where we had players who hadn't played for three months because all we had was league games and we were starting the same 11 every game. Like players like Lukonga, for example, even Pepe and Ketcher didn't really get a run in till very late on until we basically had absolutely no alternative. This this, this season, I think, A, he trusts the players a bit more and he's more willing to give people chances. But I think players like this, the second string, as you might say, will get more minutes in the Europa League. They'll get the League Cup games. And actually, hopefully now that we have more goals in the team, we can kill off games and actually say, OK, we've got 20 minutes left. Let's potentially give Pepe a run out. Let's give Enketia some minutes. Let's give El Elneny, Lokonga... Uh, Smith Rowe minutes and give them half an hour and then they'll play the Europa League game and then if needed if they're on form maybe they'll stay in the team mm-hmm. and we do that with the defenders as well um, I think it's and especially with the defence I think we will play according to the opponent I think the good thing is we have some defenders who are potentially a bit better off like you said Roger pushing up some defenders who are better off sitting a bit deeper and um you know, the the good thing is now we're not going to be forced to rush Tierney back or rush Tomiyasu back and play them when they're half fit and then they get injured again. Um, so the the squad depth, I think, for us is going to be a real strength. The fact that we have some, tr- like, we not only had 11 trusted players, we have like 16, 17 trusted players now. Yeah. My, on squad depth. We uh, have discussed how it's vastly improved, but um, there is still time left in the window. If we think about some of the areas that we think that need to be addressed, so you're, you know, what's your opinion on that? If I think off the top of my head, some examples, right? Like, you know, it's it's it struck me today that now loaning Balogun out to to Rems, which should be um, confirmed. I think it might already be confirmed. Uh, you know, loaning him out. We've also loaned out Mika Beereth and and Marcello Flores, who were the other two sort of young up and coming centre forwards. So the three young centre forwards have all gone out on loan, which effectively means that Gabriel Jesus and Eddie are the two recognised strikers in the, in the squad. For me, there's a question mark there as to you know do we need to bring in someone who can play uh, as a striker? You sort of mentioned perhaps bringing in someone who who can play wide right. Um, there's also you know we've been linked with Tielemans this window. Uh, and you know, Partey and Jacka are very much comfortably our our kind of number one and two central midfielders. And then then you know you've got Lukonga and El Neni who are very much kind of supporting acts last season. You know, in any of those areas that I mentioned or anywhere else, what do you think that we need to do before the window closes? Yeah, I think you've probably highlighted the two main areas. Um, the main one for me um, is is Thomas Partey. I think. The, the system that we seem to be moving towards is very much Thomas Partey sitting at the base of a base of midfield. You know, we touched on it, right? Xhaka, especially when we have the ball or when we have the ball, Xhaka pushing forward um, kind of down the, not so much down the left-hand side, but you know what I mean, towards the left-hand side of the pitch, but sort of left central, if that makes sense. Um, and, and and Thomas Partey really being that deep-lying midfielder. Um, and I think when you take Thomas Partey out of the team and take him out of that system, you are, and, and you look at, yeah, exactly. You mentioned El Neni, he's probably the next option to come in. The the drop off in quality is huge. It's massive, right? Um, and El Neni is great for, you know, the the odd kind of, yeah, Old Trafford away as he did last season or season before. And he had, you know, when he had to come into the team towards the end of last season, we were all kind of raving about him um, because he did, what was asked of him and he's a manager's dream, but at the same time, he doesn't offer you um, the, he doesn't offer you a, basically, you know, the technical quality that Thomas Partey gives you um, the ability to get out of kind of tricky and tight situations, the, the, the being comfortable on the ball and, um, uh, and, and be, be more willing to make forward passes and passes through the lines and really kind of driving the team up the pitch as well, which Partey does a lot for us. So, 
So that's the big one for me. I mean, I don't know if you can even necessarily address that in the transfer window in the sense of can you like if you're buying another if you're buying a play basically it's always that dilemma, right? You're trying to build the squad and you need to buy another top level player or close to top level player, but you're telling him he's probably not going to play that much. Potentially, I don't know, like we just talked about, there's not really a proper set starting eleven for every single game. But, you know, if you're signing central midfield, you're probably looking at um, Thomas Partey ahead of you in the in the pecking order, mm-hmm. um, and he's going to start most most games, most big games. So, so that that one for me is a. I would like to see us address it. I don't necessarily think Tielemans addresses that problem, but obviously he is a very very good player. And do you, you know, think um, Lukonga addresses that? It if Partey's out. Yeah, like because when we signed Lukonga, for example, it seemed to me that we were putting him as the number two. Like the ideal, right? You're right. We can't sign a 50 million player to come mm. in and play number six, right? But he just seemed like the type of like young think, enough, but yeah. enough promise to come in and do that. I think that's do it. Do you think it's he could? Probably promise at the moment. And I think we saw him struggle the second time he had to come into the team last season. That second kind of stint he had, he struggled and then he got dropped for on any pretty much, didn't he? Um, yeah. And I think that's the worry. Again, it's a, you're asking, it, it kind of depends. If it's maybe one or two games, you can cope. If it's an extended period of time, I wouldn't be comfortable with either Elneny or Lukonga, really. I think with, with Elneny, you know what you're going to get. He's just there. He's happy to be the squad guy. If he doesn't play any minutes this season, no one's going to complain. I think with Lukonga, you're kind of hoping he gets enough minutes in the Europa League and the Cup, cup games and the odd Premier League game to, to develop the season. And we kind of, you know, yeah, and exactly that. I think if you're talking 10, 15 Premier League games where well, you need a de- deputy for Thomas Partey, I'd like to see... I would like to see someone else basically um, more of a like for like replacement, but obviously that's very, very tough to find. And yeah, look, just touching on the kind of the, the, the third striker. I, so again, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Because then who do you, if you don't, if it's not like a Balogun, and I, it's not like a youth player who's happy to just sort of take, get a few games, you know, who do you bring in? I kind of look at those front players and it, it comes back to what I said earlier. They're all, it's not so much they're all interchangeable because obviously Gabriel Jesus, even Eddie and Ketia on his, like if you take Jesus and Ketia as our number nines, obviously they are that. And then you look at the next option, it's probably Martinelli through the middle. It's possibly Smithrow as a false nine. And that's probably it, I'm guessing, right? Um, but I don't know, probably push the question back to you guys. Like, could, do you realistically think we could get someone like a third? Because obviously if we get someone, would it be like we were linked with Rafinha? That didn't happen. Would Rafinha have ever been able to play through the middle? I don't really know, to be honest. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. Well, I don't, but like you said, Marisa, I don't think it's about playing through the middle as such, right? We've got, if we need it, we've got Eddie, who's like the through the middle guy. And it, you know, I know he's played sometimes on the left and right, but he is a, the in the middle striker right i think the plan is like you said earlier to have interchangeable people and you know you look at the squad we've we've kind of agreed that the front three for friday will be martinelli jesus and um saka, saka. if it's nil nil after 85 minutes 80 minutes who are we going to have on the bench we're going to have smith row we're going to have eddie and we're going to have pepe mm. that doesn't seem like it's enough to me um where you want goals if you want a goal who do you bring on pepe the manager doesn't trust him he might not even come on you could argue there are system changes you could do but if eddie you know can't do it if eddie's out if one of these players are injured for example the whole attack is we're all in on that attack and um i would and the fact that we went for rafinha the fact that we went we were prepared to go pretty high at 50 million 55 million just shows me that i think we are looking for someone who can play i think ideally right side but to add goals across the front line um and yeah it might annoy eddie yeah it might annoy jesus it might annoy saka i think pepe i think the big thing is pepe right if we can get him out we can get a little bit of money for him that frees up a squad space for an attacking player to come in that's what I was going to ask you ask you guys, right? So do you think it's... Because obviously, yeah, we've gone for Rafinha without having found a buyer for Pepe, right? Much earlier on yeah. in the window. But do you think now that we've brought in Vieira, we've spent money on Zinchenko, which was probably always going to happen, but fine, you know, it's still kind of... Uh, when you look at the net, uh, the net kind of uh, spend, um, it's still a fairly big spend. So do you think that now 
it's a case of a few outgoings clearing the the wages a little bit with some of the some of the guys like um, Leno, for example, um, Pepe, um, getting them out uh, uh, off the wage bill. Sorry, but specifically in that kind of attacking area, do you think Pepe needs to go before someone comes in? Because I agree with you, Aaron. And right, I don't, I don't necessarily think it will be enough, especially when you factor in the number of games and injuries are going to come, etc. Um, but I guess, like going back to Raj's question, it was, I guess, Raj, your question was more around kind of what happens if Jesus and Nketiah are injured. Like, are we light? through the middle is that what you were asking or was it just yeah I mean, that was that was absolutely an example of what, what we, yeah, uh, you know now what i was saying that that ultimately if you just look at the pure if you just call them recognized strikers there are two of them really yeah and i know what you guys are saying about how you know maybe our system doesn't require you to have three you know guys who you would say are predominantly strikers because we interchange we have a, a system which doesn't necessarily rely on goals just from a central striker but i guess where i was going with this is if one of those two gets injured, say if it's a long-term injury or a medium-term injury, then they are you are left with just one player who predominantly plays through the middle. And there's quite a lot of games. So ultimately, they won't play every game. And then you start getting in a situation where your other players that you end up kind of using to compensate in that central area are actually players who already are playing lots and lots of minutes anyway. So probably it doesn't necessarily help and it also then just kind of moves things around a little bit and maybe unsettles the, the team a little bit in terms of kind of, you know, where people are playing. Um, it, that, and that's where I was, I was going with this. I, I, I do agree. I, just coming back to something, you, you know, you said, Mize, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it is a case that we need to sell Pepe, for example, for that transfer to happen. I do think that logically that makes sense, but I think the evidence would suggest that, you know, when we put the bid in for Rafinha, we had basically signed all of the players that we had currently aside from Zinchenko. I think that Rafinha bid just came before Zinchenko happened. And so we were clearly willing to to part with that much money for a right winger, even before, you know, getting rid of Pepe at that that stage. I think if the opportunities there will come. I do get the distinct impression though, that the way that we, we are operating right now is how we will continue to operate, which is that mm-hmm. we're only going to go for the players that we actually really want. And it's not yeah. going to be a case of yeah. just getting a second choice. And this is what the club have been hinting. Like, you know, they've been surprisingly open about this, right? To say we're not done yet. Um, Eddie's come out and said it. Arteta's not come, come out and said it, and said we are still in the market. We are looking for players, effectively. But he's. I don't think he's directly said we're going to wait till we sell. But he's also acknowledged that the squad itself is too large in terms of we have players that we need to shift, right? Mm. Um, but you know, it's. And yeah, I think ultimately, like we're now looking at like the 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 squad is now so far ahead that we're now thinking, well, what if then we need to buy a player if Jesus gets injured, if Enketia gets injured, if Saka's injured, um, and we're thinking about that third choice striker potentially or that second choice midfielder. And actually, like the reality is, you're never going to have a perfect team with full, fully quality deputies unless you're Man City, maybe for Liverpool, potentially Chelsea, but. Actually, you take out any team's number one striker for six weeks or any team's number one central midfielder for two months, the drop-off is big, right? And um, you're going to be taking a risk. And the fact that we're now trying to address the the what-if situations and like, look, we've been there, right? We've lost Tierney for half a season. We've lost Partey for half a season. This happens to us, right? And it would not surprise me if we lost a striker for three months this summer, right? Just knowing our luck. But you just have to ride with these risks sometimes in the squad and you have to accept that if something happens that you can, you know, the other interesting thing is, you know, we've got the world cup in, in November, right? So by the time we get to January, you know, I don't know what the the numbers of games will be, but mm-hmm. actually maybe even the January window this year could be more active than it, it normally That's is true. because it's after a world cup, there might be players who become available. Players might get injured at the world cup. I, I don't know. Um, but it's going to be a weird season this season with the World Cup in between. Um, I don't really know if like players will start playing for World Cup places. Um, who knows what happens after the World Cup? But there's that effect as well, which I think it could it could be nothing, but it could also be quite significant in terms of timing. Just one thing I was going to add as well, just about the like striker situation or forward situation. I think the thing that we're probably I don't know maybe we maybe maybe it is being spoken about, maybe not. But I feel like the the kind of Eddie and Ketia 
factor hasn't really been spoken about that much. And I guess what I mean is obviously, look, if they're both injured, they're both injured. We have to deal with it, assuming we don't bring someone else in. But I think if Hazus does get injured, you with with Eddie, and, and I know this is based on the starts that he got towards the end of the season and the performances that he put in towards the end of the season when we were really pushing for top four. But, um, you know, I think everyone was very, very impressed with what he did, um, what he offered. And the good thing is, the great thing is, is that Hayes has comes out of the team. You bring in Eddie, the system doesn't really have to change. It's not like, you know, Lacazette and Eddie as your two strikers and and them offering very, very different options. Um, so I think I think we're we're almost kind of, from that perspective, better off um, in terms of like squad depth as well. So I'm quite excited to see kind of what Eddie does this season um, as well, because it's obviously, obviously, you know, we've, we've kind of committed to him. He's committed to us. Um, you know, he signed the new deal and it'll be really interesting to see kind of, I'm sh- obviously he's going to get minutes, um, the whole five subs thing, Europa League, et cetera. But, you mm. know, especially in the Premier League, he's kind of shown that he, not so much he can do it or he's done it, but it feels like we, w- we had that question about what is his level? Is it lower league, Premier League? Is it maybe even Championship? But it seems like, you know, he's he's intent and he's backing himself that he can do it at Arsenal, even with a striker like Jesus ahead of him. So, um, yeah, for me, that's really, really interesting to see. I think that's a big bonus that we go into this season with. Agree. So, look, guys, we have got a game against Palace. What I want to do is... Um... Now, I want to, as we've discussed before, we we want to get in and do some predictions for this season. Um, before I go on to the predictions for the season, kind of overall, just looking at the game in hand, just that we, we've got in front of us. So, you know, opening day last season, we we had a, we 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 kicked off the season last season as well with uh, a Friday night game at Brentford under the lights, which we sadly lost two nil. We are doing the same thing under the lights to Palace, opening the season in the same way, uh, a team we lost to three nil last season really bad memories where Aaron and I both went to that game and we are going to this one as well um now it's a bit of a different situation this I suppose uh our squad is very different to some extent Palace is not so much uh Palace's pre-season in terms of results have been relatively patchy they've not really played overall you know that great quality of opposition uh, you know if you compare it to what our our pre-season has been their transfer activity has been quite interesting as well. They haven't really welcomed many players. They've they've signed Czech Decore from Lons, um, who's a fairly highly rated defensive midfielder for about 20 million quid. And they signed a centre back from Bayern Munich called Chris Richards, who I hadn't heard before, but you know, came for 11 million from Bayern Munich. Again, relatively young guy. Aside from that, there's a couple of free transfers. There was a Malcolm Iboe, uh, who, who from Derby, who was meant to be incredibly highly rated, but I'm not sure if he's one for the future. He's only 18 years old. Sam Johnston's come on on, on uh, as a free transfer from um, West Brom. But aside from that, there haven't really been any additions. And a notable player who isn't going to be there next season, or you know, isn't going to be there on Friday, is um, is Conor Gallagher, who was amazing for them last season. He's gone back to Chelsea, his home club. He was brilliant against us when we played against them. So on the face of it, uh, Arsenal have, in terms of squad building and results in preseason, have had a uh, you know a better time of it than Palace has. But then also, from what we know very well from exa- example, the experience that I touched upon, you know, we going away to Palace is never bloody easy. It's never easy. It's never easy under the lights. It's never easy when it's a Friday night and you're opening the season and people are just going to be the fans are going to be tanked up. The fans are amazing. How do we feel about the game, guys? Um, Aaron and look, I'll go to you first. What are your predictions? And let's just try and do this in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. I think the what I think I think it will be important for us as this game will be really important for us as fans to to validate if the hype is real <laughs> in that sense, right? Like if we go and we have a continuation of what we saw against Sevilla and Chelsea and we win that three nil or something like that. Right. And we play really well. The next, you know, the, the atmosphere, we're going to start believing that actually this is something we've gone to level up. Like you, like you asked earlier on. Right. And especially because palace where we, when we went right, that was when it started to go wrong for us. Right. Mm. Like Partey went off injured, I think. Yeah. Did Tierney go off injured as well? Yeah. And um, And Partey was injured. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I think Gabriel had just had a kid. 
at that point as well, maybe. Okay. Um, and Tavares was playing, I remember that, and we were thinking, oh man, this does not look good. And um, we got comprehensively beaten last summer, mm. I mean, last, last year. Um, so for us to go there where it all almost went wrong, and if we turn up and we put a performance in with a, a newly improved squad in that sense, you know, first game of the season, I think not only will Arsenal fans take note and be like, actually, this is this is something big. It also makes the rest of the Premier League take note as well. Um, but if we don't win and something goes wrong, and we haven't really seen anything go wrong this preseason, the doubts will start creeping in. You know, is is Saliba all he's cracked up to be? Is Ben White the solution at right back? Do, do we have to bring back Cedric? Who's our best choice left back? Where are the goals going to come from? All that will start to creep back in. So I think it's a really, really important game, especially if you look at the run we've got. We've got some fairly winnable games coming up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, last summer when we started the season, we weren't ready. I think we look ready in preseason. It's, I think it's so, so important. We have to go there, put a marker down and win and ideally win well. Interesting. And do you think, do you think we will? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. What, 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 I think so. I think Zaha, Zaha's the one that worries me. I think um, I watched a few of their preseason highlights and Zaha looked in the last game, Zaha and Eze looked quite good. I didn't, I think I can't remember who they played, but it was like lower league opposition, I think. Um, but then Palace had a bit of a weird preseason. I remember when they had, I think they went like on two different preseason tours or something like that. I like sent half the squad to Australia and the other half to Singapore. Oh, really? Something I didn't weird. know that. Okay. Something really weird. Um, I'm not sure why. Should have probably researched this before I came on. But um, some, um, maybe they're not fully ready, but they did look, against lower league, league opposition, they did look like very Palace-like against... Uh, against whoever they played at the weekend. I think the key is going to be the defense. How 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 do we deal with Zaha? And also then, can our attack actually keep them pen, pegged back a bit? Because if they're more worried about Jesus and Saka and Martinelli, Zaha might not get a look in. Mm. Because last game, when we played them, they were all over us. They could have won 5 or 6 nil that, that day. Um, but actually, when we got into their box, we looked pretty dangerous. So And that was with, with Lacazette on the pitch. So if we can do that then maybe we just outscore them and we, we win something like, you know, 4-2 or something like that. Interesting. Okay. Mice, what do you think? Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of disagree a little bit with what Aaron has said, just um, around how important, I mean, it sounds a bit silly to say, but how important the first game is. Obviously, it's important and obviously we want to win. But it, it kind of feels like maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe I, the, the way I've kind of interpreted that is, it's like if we lose this game, like it, obviously it's not the case, but like panic stations set in. Um, we have to win the next game. Arteta's under pressure. And it's not like, I don't know. I still feel like, yes, the expectation, I know we're going to come on to what we all think we're going to do this season um, on the whole and where we're going to finish. But the expectation this season very obviously is Champions League football. Like we, we get Champions League football, right? Um, that is the target. And I don't know. I just kind of look at it as, yes. It, it will it, it will be bad to lose the first game, um, and it will kind of the f- the fact that we've had a really good preseason. It might, you know, were they kind of false indicators in terms of how well or how much we're ready or how ready we are? But I kind of feel like as well, you know, for me, the first game of the season, you're not we're not at home. It's not a Saturday three o'clock kickoff, and it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter because ultimately we're a better team than Palace. But I think when you add in the whole narrative. Um, as we did last season when we talked about the Brentford game and how we lost that, Um, you know, I would absolutely, I wouldn't wouldn't say I'm going to be happy with a draw, but I think a draw wouldn't be a bad result. And I think it's always really hard to predict the first game of the season for obvious reasons, right? Um, New signings, you know, how they're going to play, et cetera, and especially on the Palace side, um, how they're going to cope with get without Gallagher. And, you know, the new guys that they've signed, I know nothing about, as most Arsenal fans probably don't. Um, So for me... I'm 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 expecting that we go there and we do try and win the game and I'm expecting players like Jesus and Saka really do turn up and I think in I think I think that's just going to be the case throughout the season right they're going to be our go-to guys um and I feel like we will have a lot of the ball um I think that we're we, we, we we've got a pretty strong a very strong first 11 so I don't really see kind of as we touched on any weak weaknesses in that first 11 um and we go there full of confidence so I 
I expect us to do well and I expect us to create chances and probably score some goals, to be honest. But I'm not going to be absolutely devastated if like, you know, if we if we draw the game, I won't be devastated. If we lose the game, I'll be pissed off. I'll be annoyed as as we would be with any loss. But um, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it sets the tone for the rest of the season. Um, but I'm going to, I mean, my prediction. I yeah. Go on. No, go, go on. Make your prediction first. Uh, it's going to be a draw. Um, really? 1-1. One, one. Uh-huh. Yeah, because like, I mean, so like, do you, do, what? So if let's say we draw the game. What does that mean for one out of 38 games? No, okay. Like? I don't think it means anything in terms of where we finish, right? Well, you hope not, right? I think it's important, and I think we, you probably agree with this, that we don't let it turn into what our start last season where we then yeah. drop points. But that the was next City game, and Chelsea. Game. But that's, right? I don't think that's what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. But put it this way, I think, like, I think it's, again, I think it's about like the the, the hype, right? If we beat Palace... We beat Leicester. We beat Fulham. Is it Bournemouth, Bournemouth, then Fulham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the chat isn't going to be about top four. It's going to be how can we catch Liverpool and Chelsea? And I, don't, well, Chelsea. I don't think so. I don't know. Not, no, 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 no. And, I, and I don't think, and I don't think we will. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to be chatting then. Saying that? Chatting yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't no, 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 but what do you think Arteta is going to be telling the squad? I don't think he's going to be... Uh, I think he'll be I bringing mean, them back I down. Think, it's four think. wins against four teams you should be beating, right? If this, if those four games no, are spread across just, the middle of the season, you'd say those those are four games you get 12 points from. But what do you think the belief is going to be in the squad then? Do you think they're going to be like, oh, we're still no, a top I, four look, I, I, I think if they, with, this, with this pre-season, if we just keep winning and we build a winning habit and we have a team that plays well and wins well... They're going to start believing that I think it's a bit we a, can go further than the top four. I think no, I don't know if it's that, but I think there is a I think there is a valid point to say that because the competitiveness of the Premier League is so high, and there are genuinely six to seven teams, let's just call it six teams for now, who are genuinely believing that they can finish in the top four and have ambitions of finishing in the top four. I feel like if you are going to try and be a top four side, you almost need to behave and act and win like you are a side battling to win the title basically fighting for the title like you can't be strategizing to like finish in the top four you can't like like that can't be the goal you can't basically look and say look at city and look at liverpool and say actually they're they're kind of miles ahead of us actually you know we we don't need to be as good as them you need to be setting the benchmark really high because the competitiveness is is just so high but i don't think that the squad will be talking about the potential to win the league or anything like that. I don't uh, think yeah. Arteta will be telling them, guys, guys, like, you know, come on, let's all calm down. I know we all think we can win the league, but like, you know, one one step at a time. I don't think any of that crap's going to be coming in. But I do think that they're going to be setting themselves extremely high standards. I think they'll go into every game hoping to try and win every game. I do believe that, if that's kind of where you're going with this. But I don't think that they will. Yeah, think I think it's, that, yeah, it's a bit of both. I think it's ultimately... I I genuinely believe that the way Arteta and Edu have pitched this project is not a top four project, right? I think this is a yeah. A, maybe. We need to be competing for the title in three, four years, hmm. um, and I think, and I don't think we're going to win the league this season, right? I don't think we're going to come close. But I think if we win and we get into a winning habit the belief in this team will be so high that we have the potential to do something good. If we get a draw, then we win against Leicester, then we get another draw and then another win, for example. That is a very different... Like, immediately, I think we'll be... We'll have some distance from, I assume, City and Liverpool because they've got pretty kind fixtures at the start. Yeah. Um, they'll probably get four wins out of four. And immediately we'll be like, okay, we're looking at the table and being like, okay, how do we get to third? How do we get to fourth? If we win our first three or four games, the conversation is going to be, how can we keep winning? How can we stay on top? And then naturally we'll start dropping points. We'll eventually slip down the table. But I think for us to set a standard early on that we are in this and we are ready to compete with the best in this, in this league, not the Tottenham's, not the Man United's, but the Liverpool's, Chelsea's and uh, Man City's, it's important for us to win. Agreed. Um, agreed that it's it's important if we want those things to happen. I, 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 I though, um, I'm, I'm still a bit taken aback by your 
<laughs> I'm a bit shit like me too. So, like, uh, yeah. I'm a bit shell shocked. I'm a bit shell shocked. I don't, I don't think we'll come close. I think we are. We'll get injuries, mate. But, but it doesn't matter if we don't way, get injuries. We, if, it doesn't matter if we have no. Like <laughs> if no one gets injured, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. What difference? Is it? We're not like no, no. Actually, well, no. Put it this way: if we keep all of our first eleven, our first, but you, but you just, but happens, you just, right? Right, wait, mate. You just but, said like twenty minutes ago that the the attacking players that we got. And there's not enough goals in that team. So when you look at the number of goals that City and Liverpool score, like we were talking about, we didn't sign Rafinha, the, you know, the yeah. forwards that we've got. So, I mean, you're talking, I don't know how many goals the City and Liverpool score, 100 plus, right? And we're sitting on sort of 60 odd goals a season. Like, we're not making up 40 goals, first of all. No, no, I don't think we're going to. So then we're relying on us. I don't think a, come April, yeah. come April, I don't think we're going to be winning. But I think we we have the potential to come third. I, I agree with that, but that doesn't mean that we're anywhere near um, City or Liverpool, right? Like we don't, we could, we could be twenty or thirty points off City, and Liverpool, and still finish third. Possibly, I think, I think we'll get closer if if we <laughs> if we if we keep our players fit. I don't think we'll keep our players fit. Hmm. Um, I think our squad will for will start to fail the minute you take a Thomas Partey out, a Jesus out. Uh, even an Erdegaard out of this team, I think we start dropping points. What's Hypothetically, it, though, if we keep... So I, I will can, continue talking, but let's just... Can we just frame this? And in the end of what you're going to say, can you just conclude on where you think we will finish this season and also how you think we're going to do in, in the cup competitions, whether you think we'll win one? So carry on with the where we are going. But, All right, okay. But, but so I think in a hypothetical office. situation where we... Yeah, where we don't get injuries and we... Don't. Why are you giving us a hypothetical? No, mate, just, tell me yeah, what you think is going to happen. Let me finish my point. In an average amount of injuries, like, do you okay. know what I mean? All right, okay. But let me, in a hypothetical situation where we don't get those injuries, I think we at, we have the potential to finish something like ten points off City and Liverpool. But then so did Chelsea. Um, yeah, and that's but that's 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 a great season, right? If we did that. No, but I'm saying right. it's in your. I hype. don't think that will happen, right? But that's saying if Chelsea yeah. don't get any injuries or or Spurs basically in his injuries. hypothetical universe, we get no injuries. Everyone else gets a normal amount <laughs> yeah, exactly. of injuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That hypothetical universe. Okay. Um, okay, but realistically, we will get injuries. We will lose players. <sighs> Should I be optimistic? Seventh. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> because, you know, after we'll layer it on with what you think we should be, you know, aiming for and what Arteta should be accountable for. But what do you what do you think was going to happen this season? I think we will finish fourth. I was I, I couldn't decide between third and fourth. You think we'll I finish think, fourth? I think fourth. What do you think the top As, four if we don't if I think Man City will win the league. I think Liverpool, probably Chelsea. I think it'll be us and Chelsea. Uh, only because I don't want to predict Spurs finishing above us. Um, and then I think Spurs, Man United. Um, if we finish fourth, we don't care. If we finish but, fourth, you know. Yeah. No. And and what so? Do you, and what about the cup competitions? Can you see us winning any of the cups? I can. I can. I think we should be going for the Europa League hard so I can I see no reason why we can't win it do you think so, we will it's, it's a cup competition it's harder to predict but yeah why not I don't know you're making, like, you're making the this type of prediction thing way harder than it should be the <laughs> hypothetical <laughs> universes and your why not I think the only thing that stops us is if, if like a, a Bayern Munich drop into the Europa League by accident Fine. or something like that okay um, but no I think we all win the Europa League this year okay um, and I think we're the best team in the Europa League this year by far Fair. Uh, Myers, what do you think? Um, so I think Premier League, I think I think fourth is achievable. And I think, yeah, I, I'm kind of similar to Aaron and actually in terms of um, I was kind of debating between third and fourth, but I think I'll go fourth to probably to be a little bit safe. Um, it's interesting though, because the Chelsea fact, like Chelsea is like a weird one because of, but like they've signed signed like Sterling, for example. Like I love Sterling. I think he's I think he's I think he's just such a top player. But then like they've sold pretty much most of their defense. But then they bought in Kudibali. So it's just like you just don't know. There's quite a new like a lot of factors or change, moving parts with Chelsea. 
Um, and I think Tottenham will be back up there, assuming <clears throat> they keep Conan, Conan sane, uh, Kane and Son fit. <laughs> um, so I think it will be a bit of a dogfight for third and fourth, um, but I think we might nab fourth. Um, but I don't think we'll be... What about Man United? I don't know, mate. It's again, new manager. I'm not really sure. I think they, they could be there. I really don't know. Who knows? Like they can't. Their transfer like dealings have been awful so far. Um, don't know what's happening with Ronaldo. So such a long time to go in the transfer window as well. A lot can change. A lot can happen. So yeah. it's quite difficult to say from that, you know. Um, and yeah, but I don't think we'll be anywhere near. I think Liverpool might win the league this season. And I don't think we'll be anywhere near Liverpool or City. Uh, yeah, not for a few seasons at least, or a couple of seasons if if we if that's the target. Obviously, that is a target, but no, like we'll still be 30, 40 points off them this season. Thirty years, thirty points, let's say. Um, you think we thirty points off the top? Yeah, like where, where, how many did I don't know honestly, but Liverpool must have got. Uh, sorry, City must have got what ninety ninety six. I think it was. Did we didn't? Did we well, we got seventy. We didn't. We were low seventies, yeah, but then. I mean, okay. like, even I if mean, they catch a, up, yeah. their, their standards are just so much higher, right? Like, I just, I'm not even looking at them as like a, a, even thinking about getting anywhere near them. To be honest, this season's not, yeah, um, uh, yeah, uh, and then yeah, in terms of cup competitions, like yeah, again, I agree with Aaron, and like we should be going all out. For, for me, the Europa League is massive this season. Like, um, it's because it, if if something does go tits up in the in the league. Um, or things are just not working out, or there's just lots of teams going for third and fourth, like United, like Tottenham, like Chelsea, and it just becomes a really hard battle for fourth. And it could be just a point, two, three points in it come the end of the season. You know, the Europa League is that is that gateway into the Champions League. So I think we need to absolutely be going all out for it. And I think we will. I think you could just see by the squad that we're building, you know, we've talked about it all this, this whole entire episode, right? The squad depth that we've got. And even if you think of some of the players that, haven't gone yet and we don't really know what's happening with them there's a very good chance they'll go but then if you look at players like reese nelson maitland niles um i don't know i can't think of anyone else off the top of my head but there's a few players like that that you know you wouldn't be sad to see them go really if we're getting decent fees for them or whatever i think we're getting good deals for them but at the same time if they're in the europa league squad and they play that the group stage games and the games that we need them to to kind of fill in for you know that, 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 that that's great and um so I, so I kind of feel like at the moment, we, or we have been, we are looking at building, we're looking at, we are building towards a squad where you've got two options in every position. Um, and I think that suffices for the initial stages of the group, group uh, Europa League group stage, sorry. So I think, I think we'll get pretty far in the Euro- Europa League. I can see us kind of getting to semis at the very minimum, but from then on, who knows what happens, right? I'm not sure if, if we'll actually go on and win it. Um yeah, and, and cup competitions, cup competitions, mate. Like like Aaron said, who who the hell knows? Um, would be lovely to go to Wembley again. So fingers crossed, but n- not really sure to to be honest. Cool. I um I sort of probably similar to to what you're thinking, my to be honest. I I I, I think we'll finish fourth, and I think that I'm going to predict us to win the Europa League, and I think I. The Europa League is on the basis that I think it is massive for us. I think that it's an opportunity to set a kind of a bit of a culture as well. Like, you know, you win that trophy, you automatically qualify for the Champions League. And and it's, um, you know, it's something that I think can act as a really big springboard. And I think Arteta knows. And I think Arteta and the squad will look at it and go, we can win the Europa League. Um, I think that the thing that might be interesting for us and might help with that fourth. So I think that the top, I think Liverpool might win the league. Uh, I think City will, will finish second. I think Chelsea will finish third, and I think we'll finish fourth. And the reason I, I, I'm going, I'm, I'm saying that as opposed to Tottenham, because I think you know, fair enough, it, it might be the easy option for as an Arsenal fan to not say that Tottenham are going to finish in the top four. But I think that, um, I think what's interesting here, right, is that Conte is Conte is a big manager, and he wants to win trophies. Uh, I, I, I don't think he necessarily wants to manage a Tottenham team just for the hell of finishing in the top four every year. I think that he'll really want to win something or, you know, if not, then I think he'll probably want to move soon to some team that can win something. I think he's just that sort of guy. And I think you might look at this season and kind of go, I might have a shot at the Champions League. I think that he might think that Tottenham have got a better chance of winning the Champions League than they have of the Premier League. And I think if he, he might think that if he can keep Kane and Son, which I think he will keep them this year, he might have built a squad which is potentially good enough to go up against a lot of teams in two legs. I think that he'll be encouraged by the fact that 
they beat a lot of big teams you know last last season in the premier league even like city i think they beat city twice home and away right um like I think stuff like that will encourage him. I think that might help us because I think that therefore when they come into these Champions League games, I think Kane and Son will think very similarly to Conte too. I think they'll think that like, you know, maybe this might be one of their last seasons. If Conte, you know, especially if they can keep Conte, this is a chance to win something. I think they'll be focused on the Champions League. I think that might help us in in terms of the league. And I think they might, I'm, I think they might be one of those teams that drops points during those kind of uh, in between games, you know, before and after a Champions League game. Uh, Hopefully we don't do a similar thing in terms of the Europa League if we are really going to go for the Europa League. But I think the Chelsea just kind of have that that know-how. Tuchel has the know-how. I think a lot of their players are experienced. And I think ultimately they are still a pretty talented squad. So look, I'm going to go with Arsenal finishing fourth and I'm going to go with us uh, winning the Europa League. I I do, I do I really like our chances at you know another cup competition, but I do think that I'm just being a little bit greedy in that perspective because... <laughs> like the other teams probably feel the same way um so i'm just gonna i'm gonna keep it at that i think put it this way i think we will win a trophy this season i think uh yeah i'm kind of hedging my bets a little bit there but i do think we'll win one um but not guys league, we'll, not the premier league definitely not winning the premier league we've got no chance of winning the premier league <laughs> what if um what if we don't have any injuries <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, like, I think you do need luck with injuries to, to achieve anything, but still, no, like, I can't see it. Um, okay, guys, just before we, we close, I suppose the last question is, you know, who, who do you think is going to be our standout player this season based on what you've seen so far? Aaron and... Martinelli. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mice? I would just name him. Want, yeah. I was going to say, did you want to talk about it? Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to know why? I just think, um, I think like we had that big injury season and then last season he was just figuring out what the hell is going on. Like, where does he fit into this team? Now he's figured it out. I see a clear role for him and yeah, he's figured it out. He's this like guy that plays on the left that comes inside and he's got his Brazilian mate alongside him. Um, and, and his Portuguese speaking mate, two. like, you know, Fabio Vieira, they're apparently good friends now, you know, it's all fitting in. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, I think, yeah, Saka will continue to do his thing. Um, Gabriel Jesus will get goals. I think the standout player could hopefully be Martinelli, who might be the reason that we end up scoring and progressing and you know, playing better in games and getting more goals ultimately than we have done previously. Yeah, I think you could pick... There's probably a number of players, one of a number of players that you could probably go with. Martin is definitely a good shout. Gabriel Jesus is the obvious one. But for me, I think I think that if we're talking kind of standout player this season, I think it's going to be Martin Odegaard. Um, reasons being um, he's integral to the way that we play. Um, he operates in that number 10 area. And I think he's now got, I mean, he kind of, had it already like you saw for example the goal uh, the the penalty that we got against um Sevilla right like he picks up the ball in the middle of the park Saka makes the run dinks the ball over it's a perfect sort of chipped through ball whatever you want to call it um and it creates a penalty and I can just see that scenario happening quite a bit this this season now you add Hazus into the mix um you just add a much much better striker um, a striker that's willing to run off the ball a lot more um, and and try those runs uh, off the last man a lot more than Lacazette was a, was willing to do so, and I think he's just going to become. Well, he's just going to. He he's already been he's already been very very good for us. I think he's just going to go on to another level another level this season. I'm kind of hoping he adds a few more goals to his game as well, so he kind of other people take notice of him a bit more because I think he's really appreciated by Arsenal fans. I'm not sure he's necessarily appreciated by fans of other clubs. Um, because they look at stats and kind of dismiss him as as not one of the sort of top creators in the league, but he definitely is, and I think he's going to now bag loads of assists with um, with Jesus in front of him, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and I think we're just going to see the best of him this season. So I'm going for Erdegaard. I do really like that actually, and it's it's a weird one because I kind of agree with everything that you just said, Mize. I, I like uh, Aaron, and I like your romantic story arc there of it kind of being like a nice a nice kind of end to the Martinelli trilogy of like you mentioned those three seasons kind of, but um, because of the fact, I, I agree with where you're going, Myers, I actually think that therefore that will fuel Gabriel Jesus having such a fantastic season. Mm. 
that I think that ultimately goals are the hardest bit about the game. And, and if we do achieve something, um, you'll probably look at back and see who scored those goals. And I, and I have a, unless he gets a, a medium to big injury, um, I'd be very surprised if he doesn't score at least 20 goals this season. So. Um, and, and I'd probably go a step further when I said, and I, and I think that, cause I think that there'll be a few games and this didn't really happen last season. hadn't really happened, uh, you know, for, for, for a few seasons. I think there'll be a, a couple of games where we might really batter a couple of teams. Like I think there'll be days where it just completely clicks and and it'll be fine and and so I can see him getting a couple of hat tricks. I I basically think I think there's a chance he could score twenty Premier League goals. I think there's a chance that could happen. Um, so basically based on all that and it, and partly because because I think Odegaard will be brilliant. Um, you know I think we I am optimistic about this season. Uh, it's just that the the only reason I'm not you know predicting us to finish any higher is just because the quality of the Premier League is so high. Um, hmm. But um, yeah, look, I think I think it'll be Gabriel Jesus. Um, guys, we've been recording for about an hour and a half, so this might actually be our longest episode ever. I think that's by virtue of the fact of not recording for a, a, a month. Clearly, we had lots to say. Um, so I think like it's probably the right thing to do to wrap it up there. We've given our predictions, our uh, where we think Arsenal are getting up, the top four, who's going to be the best player. And, and I think we all, apart from... No, two of us are predicting a Palace win. Sorry. Two of us are predicting a win against Palace, and Mize, you are predicting a draw. A good, a, a decent draw, yeah. A decent draw, a decent, a decent draw. draw. Um, in fact, actually, I don't know if I even actually did. I predict. No, you didn't. No, you yeah. didn't do it. You didn't. But you've just announced it, so you think we're going to win? Yeah, um, I do. I, I'm uh, okay. I'm going to say yeah, and I'm going to say that we're going to win two one, um, but. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's one all, but if it is one all, I really think that'll be because Palace's fans, the atmosphere will will spur them on because I don't think, you know, based on how the squads have shaped up and based on pre-season, I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't be winning that game. But I think at the end of the day, you know, atmosphere does play a, a big factor into it, playing away at a tough ground. So that we'll see, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, okay, guys, cool. Thank you very much. Hopefully it's not going to be another month before we record next. We may, there are rumours that, you know, the fourth arseholic, D'Artagnan, if you like, may be returning <laughs> because he may be getting his internet sorted. And I'm making it sound like he hasn't had internet for a year. No, he's, that, he's that he had quite a from um, dial-up, isn't he? Yeah, basically, yeah. basically, he's just a bit old school, that guy. But yeah, so cool. All right, look, thank you everyone for joining us, Mize. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you for this 90-minute uh, session. Um Thanks, and we're in injury time now, so let's finish. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a nice time until we speak to you next. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, guys. See ya. Bye. Cheers. Bye.